All right. Welcome to the 1978 podcast. I'm here with the magnificent Elliot Lester. Elliot, how are you, buddy? I don't know how you top that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's all the it's downhill all the way. I'm good. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to breathe in. Uh, trying, yeah, in, yeah, trying to breathe in between the the fires, the uh, the global pandemic, and, and the economic downturn, and the failure you, you, to sort of you, grasp all that. You've directed um, dramatic movies, but it's almost like we're in a dramatic movie day to day now. Well, I would I would say my films feel like a, feel like a comedy compared to what we're <laughs> facing. I mean, I mean, there's one thing for melodrama. There's another thing when you know the fires are like two miles from your house, which is uh, scary. It's well, very scary. the uh, The funniest thing I've noticed about fiction or real life is that people tend to amp things up you know you amp things up for for a film with the script you want things to be dramatic or or sort of heightened but then it's almost like the same thing happens in real life and i guess we go back to the you know art imitates life thought it's a a famous book called simulation and simulacrum which is uh, how how what we create in reality will eventually be what we will, will eventually be our reality, and the lines are sort of merging, and that's sort of where we are right now. I think it's like it's like being in some sort of bad B movie, you know. <laughs> except except instead of just having it be an inferno and a global pandemic, we've got everything all at once. But yeah. I, I think that as human beings, we sort of find our resolve. In these situations, I mean, it's doom and gloom when you're in it. But if you think about your life and you think about the, the, the history of the world, I mean, we're actually edging forward. We're actually making big strides yeah. um, rather than going back, going backwards. I mean, we've been through fires before. We've been through earthquakes before. We've certainly been through the Spanish flu, world wars. Um, the Trump government isn't going to bring America down. Um, but the worst situation is the worst situation you're in at that time, I think. Yeah. That's actually a really good point because there's been some really horrible stuff. And, um, earlier in the, um, when it was just a pandemic and not everything else, uh, I was thinking about that. I thought, I don't know when work's going to come back. I don't know when things are going to be normal. But then again, when, when Lyndon Johnson was president and people were, being sent to Vietnam, we didn't know when things were going to get normal then either. So eventually, at some point, things come back down. But well, they just re- they just readjust. I mean, like you know, um, if you think about the quality of your life now, and if you were thinking about the quality of human life even a hundred years ago, we are yeah. hugely evolved. I mean, yeah. economically, it's the most prosperous time to be alive. Health-wise, we're healthier than ever. We live longer. You know, we know more. We're more educated. We're more enlightened. So, I mean, I may be a glass, the only glass half full kind of guy you speak to <laughs> today, but I actually think I think we're actually doing doing okay. And also, it's 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 pumpkin spice season at Starbucks. So, how <laughs> I can I be? The world is okay. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I think this is nothing. Just this hand out nothing. pumpkin spice lattes and tell them to I mean, take that's a deep it, breath. Right? What else do you need? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you see those commercials come up, you know, uh, at least things are moving forward, right? Well, I mean, the, the worst... <laughs> is that you actually cease existing is that you're not yeah. conscious and you're not able to experience anything. So, I, I mean, I would rather, even if it's something awful, I'd still rather be alive and experiencing it than not. Very true. I was talking to somebody about dramatic writing, and uh, he said that um, these some of these stories, whether it's TV or movies, um, you know, someone's being chased – or beaten down or whatever and 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 really that that those aren't 
the scariest or most um, painful things that you could show or that a character could go through. It's really the the, the being having your your ability to sort of be yourself, having that taken away, is actually kind of more frightening. It doesn't need to be physical pain put on you, like punching, kicking, or weapons or stuff. And um, one of the things that makes this whole scenario going on in the world right now the most difficult, in my opinion, is that you don't know how or when it's going to end or what the resolution is. You just feel like what's next or what's next. Yeah. You want to torture people. Um, One of the, one of the ways to torture people is, um, and I hope this isn't taken out of context is that um, it's not the actual act of being hit or electrocution. It's the not knowing when Yeah, it's the anxiety Right. And it's a constant, constant anxiety. I mean, I definitely feel, and I can say that having lived in America for 24 years, that the way the news is reported, we're always on a high alert. It's constantly, 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 yeah. you know, push that button, push that button, push yeah. that button. And, and you know, um, what that does is it creates this overwhelming anxiety and you don't know what's real you don't know what really is a, is a problem yeah. so we're, we're in the we're in fires right now if these fires will stop the air will clear and then there'll be a new anxiety then there'll be the yeah. election anxiety then there'll be the economic yeah. downturn i mean it's just, yeah. but yes to your i don't know who the writer was but to your point yes it's yeah. always a psychological existential crisis that's harder than the some psychopaths running after you with a mallet right yeah, anything anxiety. I can handle that. <laughs> Just keep running. The anxiety yeah. is tough. It's when it's internal. Yeah, that and internal fear in the the was it George oh. Bush? Um, uh, the the um, George Bush uh, Junior, I guess it is. I forget his middle name. Um. He started that thing. It was like the Am- the Amber Alert, didn't he? Didn't he enact that? Oh, are you talking about um, he enacted it with Homeland Security I, that we I would think. go? We'd have different. Level. I don't know who it was, but then we'd have different stages of yeah. like. Well, the, my favorite one is actually the Doomsday Clock. <laughs> That's a good. It's like, hey, everyone. Do you know about? Do you know about the Doomsday Clock? The yeah. Doomsday Clock is a thing that exists that, and it gets closer and closer to midnight. All right. And I think we're like four minutes away or two minutes yeah. away. And I don't. I wonder how they sort of calculate. It. I don't either. But it, just the fact that they that someone said there needs to be a a ticking clock, just like the you know a tool you would use in screenwriting. This whole ticking clock scenario. There needs to be one of those in real life to keep everyone on their toes, or or because I can't imagine what other purpose it has other than to. And like I was saying, anxiety. The, yeah. Like the Amber Alert thing, um, yeah, I, I can see where the point of it to help, but at the same time, it's almost like, you know, why not inject calm and and stability? Because an Amber Alert, you can't, just, you can't make, you can't. Well, I mean, there's there's many reasons. Um, you keep people engaged. And you keep, certainly from a broadcasting news point of view, you keep people engaged in like, yeah. just get through the commercial break and we'll tell you what's going to happen. Yeah. So, I mean, I just think that's to generate sort of like eyes. If you can hold someone's attention and you can keep them, same with the internet, keep them scrolling. Yeah. You know, what's yeah. next, what's next, what's next? You, you know. It's a strange. We're here to talk about, what are we here to talk about? We're just here to talk about doom and doom gloom. Day. We're just doom, doom, and, doom and gloom. And gloom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had enough of that. <laughs> I had enough of that. Um, what's uh? Could you kind of break down kind of how you got into the the work you're into? Because your your work stands out really strong, but Thank how you, you sort of arrived there? Is yeah, it- I mean, I will take you from. I'll I'll tell you about where it started. So I finished. I traveled around the world. And I'd lived in India and Uzbekistan and I'd lived in all these incredible countries. And then I went to university and I did like a philosophy degree. 
at university in Leeds. And I sort of dabbled with the idea of being creative. I never felt like I was super creative. Um, but I knew I wanted to be in the movie business. And I worked in London doing commercials. I was a production assistant. I did that for about a year, and I got very frustrated, probably because my desires were greater than my experience. Yeah. So I was like, I've got to go, I've got to. Anyway, so you know what I thought? I, let me travel around America for three or four months. Let me see if I like it, because I had a yen for it. Mm. I traveled around America, I ended up living in the valley for like a, a month or so. And I was like, I, I want to be here. You know, it's a, <laughs> LA it's like a is magnet. so inviting. Every LA, so when you're not living in LA, is so inviting. It's yeah. so, the weather's always great. There's all this potential, potential, potential. So I went back to London and I said, I said, well, I'm, I'm going to move to America. So I was able to apply for a visa, which you can't really do anymore. Yeah got this visa and I came here and I just started as a production assistant. I started at the very bottom doing the shittiest jobs. Yeah. Um, but I always knew I wasn't going to stay in that position. I was like, you know what? And I'm here and I'm in America and I'm, I'm I was running after Winona Ryder, giving, making sure she had her coffee and, you know, just doing everything I could possibly do. So um, when I'd worked in England, I worked for this, I was doing a commercial and this very nice costume designer came up to me and she goes, what do you want to do? I said, well, I don't know. I'm sort of confused. She goes, well, why don't you do this? Pick two people on the set that you like. I said, if you like those people, become them. She said, well, one of them was the first AD. And the oh. other was the director. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> very different jobs. Uh, very different jobs. Yeah. But I ended up doing both. So when oh, I first you? started, yeah, I was a mm. first AD for about, well, I, I, I came here when I was like 22. I was a first AD by 24. Yeah. And um, so what I did when I came to, when it, long story long, is that I, I became a PA didn't do that for very long, became a production coordinator doing country and western videos for like um, Brooks and Dunn and Faith and Tim. And I, did the, I didn't know who these guys were. I mean, they were obviously now I really, legendary people. Um, and I did that. And then a friend of mine was Tony Kay's assistant. Tony Kay is a very famous sort of... Um, commercial director who sort oh, of had okay. a little fall from grace and he was directing this movie called American History X oh that guy yeah yeah okay so um I somehow ended up getting a couple of days being a first AD wow. on American History X wow how funny but I realized that people wanted to hear the stories about what the set was like because it was a very chaotic sort of thing. Yeah, I read that. So I, d I dined out on those stories and I managed to get a lot of work. Huh. People would be like, oh, you're the AD that was on American History yeah. What was that like? And then I became this sort of like young, sort of hip first AD that people wanted to hire. Huh. Um, so I was 24 and you sort of, I didn't know much about being an AD, to be honest. I sort of sort of forged forced ahead until Don't, eventually we all have to do that to get work around here. Yeah, I sort of I sort of like was like yes, I'm going to do this. But then you know sometimes you do jobs you're a little and over your head, but you sort of got by. But anyway, I ended up working. I found my I found my people, and I ended up doing a lot of rap videos because at the time, don't you? <laughs> no, sorry, it's me, not you. Um, uh, <laughs> I started. I started um, doing these like lots of rap videos, big budget stuff, and became a first AD in that world and worked solidly for about five or six years. I mean, yeah. did really well. Directing or AD? A just as an AD. Oh yeah. And then I. That's a lot to um, AD. Music videos are. They go long. I preferred it. I preferred it to commercials. Oh really? I made the same. I made. I ended up. You would make more money. To be honest, you would make. 
you it was you get make more money doing music videos than you would um, uh, commercials. Um, but I stayed on that train, and it was amazing to me. It's absolutely mm. amazing. And I was always sort of like, one thing I remember was just like how open America was. It's just like it didn't matter. Didn't matter. I could have been yeah. a criminal. I could have murdered somebody. It didn't. There was no. It was like going into the French Foreign Legion, <laughs> you know, where they don't. They like no one knew about your history. No one cared uh, about your history. Especially like in this art, business, like the art department. Like yeah. The art department. <laughs> especially in this business. You you could you could come straight out of prison, walk onto you know meet the right person, get hired. They don't know who you are, where you come from. If you're available and you're there at six a.m., <laughs> I think, that, I think I, that's the thing. Yeah, you want to do lock up, go for it. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, you know I killed a man. I'm like, just come <laughs> over there, lock up, make sure no one walks through. We'll talk okay, about that later. You're not near anybody. Those are homeless people over there. They don't. <laughs> um, we def- I definitely def- I definitely work with a few gang members. Who yeah. Did that. And the rap videos, yeah. But then, so I mean, it wasn't just rap videos; it was also like other stuff. But it was—I had a lot. I, I mean, I was flying around the country. You know, I was in New York and Miami and St. Louis and Atlanta. We were just just going, going, going. And then I was doing a Foo Fighters video. And I was standing on a bridge, and then I realized, in this moment, I was done. <laughs> really? I can, I rem, I rem, it was like five o'clock in the afternoon. I had think I think I must have done about five hundred videos, and I was like, "Do you know what? I don't think I can do this anymore." Wow! I just I, I wanted to excel. Yeah. Um, was there something that happened and that triggered that day, or has it just been building? I think it'd been building. I think what had happened that day was I was asked to do something that I didn't agree with, mm. and I think that. I was asked to do something. There was a little girl, and it was really, really windy on this bridge. And she was the girl was crying and stuff. And the director was like, "Get her to walk this way." And I was just like, I turned and I just said, "I can't do that. I'm sorry. I'm. I don't. I'm not doing it." What do you mean? You've got to be for the. I'm like, I'm not doing it. Mm. That was it. Find someone else that will. You know. Yeah. And, um, that was the sort of end of it. I got. I got. When you're in that job, when you're in that position, I'm just saying as an AD, when you're yeah. working with artists and things like that, there's an authority that you have to have. There's an authority that you have to sort of like as a chain of command thing. And sure. they don't always realize that you're there for their good to make sure that they don't spend too much money and you don't go over schedule because, you know, if you're over schedule, you start losing money. Right. Um, and, you know, I had it. I think I'd had a cu- I had, I had a gun pulled on me a couple of times. Wow. And I, re- I remember part of it was comedy. It was just like, oh, my God, this is actually happening. And part <laughs> of me was just like, oh, my God, this is really happening. Yeah. <laughs> There's, There's a duality to it. It pulled on you in the sense of, like, during the li- in line of work, like, they didn't want you to... You don't have to go down um, that road, but I mean, was it during work? Like, I mean, I can. I the only thing I can't do is name names, yeah. obviously. But I remember, I remember there was I uh, was shooting a job in New York, and you know, look, the, the guys were all high and drunk. Yeah, and you know, he said, you know, hey man, you know, you're sort of mentally home alone, and I was like, okay, whatever. And he goes, look at this, and he pulled out his. Um, it's 45. He said, you see this? This is you at the end of the shoot. And I was like, okay. Wow. So I remember I turned to the director and I turned to the producer. I said, this, this is not, this isn't, this isn't good. So an hour before rap, they got me a car and they got me out of there. Because I thought the guy was going to shoot. Me. <laughs> it's funny that that didn't make you say, I got to get out of this. It was the no, other No, because thing. I was, no, because, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean. I had one time I was shooting in downtown Los Angeles and um, the entourage showed up yeah. on this massive job. The entourage. And the entourage went through the craft service, yeah. they went through the catering, they went through, and there was no food for the crew yeah. at lunchtime. And then uh, I'll never forget, we were shooting. Uh, I can talk about this one. This was Snoop Dogg. Sure. We were doing Snoop Dogg. And there was this giant bodyguard who was standing in front of the light and he was eating. 
And I said, uh, I said, guys, I said, I said, we've got to get this guy out of the way because he's blocking the light and it's blocking the key light and I can't get a light on Snoop. Yeah. So the guy wouldn't move. So finally, I get off of, I'm running up and I, what, what, what's your name? Pookie. Okay, <laughs> Pookie. Pookie's just like eating. Yeah. I said, listen, um, you're blocking the light. You're blocking the shot. He's like, the shot looks fine to me. I oh said, my God. the shot's not. So I go to Sno- I said, Snoop, can you, you got to get this guy out of the way. He's blocking the light. But he took, that's what, that, that's what it was. Yeah. A lot of fun. But no, I, I got, I got, I think I could just got burnt out on it. I just got, yeah. you know, you get to a certain point where you're like, okay, now I need to move on. Yeah. And I was, uh, involved with a, um, a really fantastic singer songwriter called Santi Gold and I convinced Santi to let me shoot a music video for her and uh, I did her very first music video oh that's cool which was I mean I had such a good time but I mean like in I was very naive and what I ended up doing I ended up throwing you know it was music video salad so I had like a dwarf on a tricycle I had a guy with a fish stroking a fish I, no, there was no concept it was just yeah, like it's one take of those. the weirdest kill, you know, just, it was a salad anyway somebody saw it and loved it oh wow well. and then I became this was, as the, a, this was as a director you did this one this was as a director it was my yeah. first director and then from there I became the born again Christian music video king uh, well you know it's funny it's like it seemed like every time you jump into something people at least in your in your path, as soon as you did it, someone sort of caught on. I think that's more of a function that the business likes new, uh, to be honest. You know, they we need new directors, new actors, new writers, new voices. You know, that's what's amazing about the business. Yeah. Is that you can, you can just, look, I, I, I've, listen, I... I've been very lucky. You know, I've made films that people have seen. Some have enjoyed, some haven't. That's okay. But I've been able to do it. I'd rather, I'd rather have done it than not, you know. And until, I don't know who, who the other artists you've spoken to, but until you've actually taken those steps to uh, forge ahead, you don't know what it's like. Yeah. It's very easy to criticize it when yeah. you don't do it, though. Which most people do. It's insane the amount of criti- especially with the internet, the amount of criticism. I don't. I don't. I sort of drown that out. Yeah. I think that the the if you start listening to too much of the chaos inside your head and the chaos, of it, it's impossible. So you'll never get you'll never get anything done. You'll be so paralyzed by what everyone else thinks, and then that's not really a life worth lived, is it? No. You know, if you if you're like, oh, it you know, well, so and so infect your mind and you just you're not thinking about the work and then you're thinking about what people are going to say about the work we're in that discourse right now where we've become so overly politicized and so um uh politically correct that we've become fearful of creativity you know you can't tell me what my creativity has to be Uh, and what we're doing is we're sort of siloing things it's like we're in this conversation where only black people can write about you know black shows and and you know latin people can only write about latin shows and i think that's a mistake do you do you remember mistake. um remember that fox show uh in living color oh my goodness yeah i yeah. love that show was so great and it was almost like a representation it's comedy of, well it's like they were fearless they, they were poking fun at everybody can't do that now. And now it's like um, that would just get that wouldn't even make it to to they wouldn't even get funding. It would never even become. But it, it wasn't meant to be harmful. It was meant to sort of, you know, just I- express our differences in a way, and it was done with love. And it's even if you have those intentions now, it's almost like it won't it won't work. Even if you don't have bad intentions, you can't. That's, I mean, I think that's a function of the more about the way we use social media and the way we sort of want to enforce sort of a divide. You know, the divide on the left is as bad as the divide on the right. You know, um, it's almost like there's a line in the sand with everything, with people, with, with, I mean, like, you know, 
I got a neighbor down the street who I, I don't talk to and he avoids me. Not, not why, not, why? Know, I just have never talked to the guy and I, I don't know what it is, but, um, I, I try to stay organized and keep things clean and blow the leaves off the lawn and cut the grass and wash the car and like, just make sure everything's like sort of taken care of and organized. You're a good neighbor. Right. And, and I'm not trying to speak, you know, make myself look good, but this person doesn't take care of anything. There's garbage on the lawn. Everything's filthy and uncut grass. And I think that there's a judgment being made. And I mean, I can't say that this person's, um, you know, to blame because I've never gone out of my way to talk to them, but we just never interacted. I don't know why I thought of this, but it's almost like we, it's like we're two different ways of, of dealing with our little section of the neighborhood. And I mean, they, look, you know, without having a value judgment on it, um, <laughs> he's entitled to live the way yeah, he wants to live. Absolutely. I was talking to this about this with um, my friend Ray, and it's almost inherent that humans create these circles. You know, even back like in high school, you have the jocks, the the nerds, and that kind of thing. Right. And we sort of stick to our group. I I end up surrounding myself with artists and people that have kind of found, you know, forged their own way and create their own identity and things like that. And have you read uh, Sebastian Younger's Tribe? No. I'll write that down. I recommend. I'll go show you the book. This book. It's called Tribe. Okay. And it's about, well, he's a, he's a really fantastic journalist and he talks about some... Um, he talks about um, identity yeah. and how uh, he was in the military. He, he was a journalist. He also was in, he covered sort of uh, the military. I think he did um, a movie called uh, The Strapper. But oh, he yeah. talks about everyone, co- tribes are very, very important. Finding your people are very, very important and sort of having that unity and that, that what's going on now is that we're killing communities. We're killing off sort yeah. of like uh, a cohesiveness by not sort of like there's no identity, you know, it's also it's so radically individualized. Yeah. You know? When you, when you were doing music videos and then you, then you transitioned to start doing directing and you, did you leave, uh, ADing behind completely? I had a really interesting thing with the AD thing. Um, I had had one particular client who I must've done too good of a job as an AD who did everything he could to stop me from being a director. Wow. He would call all the video commissioners and say, you mustn't hire this guy. And no, no, no. I'd be like, Jesus. really? Who cares? I mean, that's the thing. By, by the thing, it hasn't stopped me. And it didn't stop me. And I've eclipsed that person's career. But it's funny that there are the people try to hold you back. And they're not holding you back because of anything you've done wrong. They're holding you back because it's things that they haven't done. You know what I mean? Or Amazing. It's, it's quite, it's quite, but... Um, I did videos. I listen. As good as it got was, I had three videos on t- in TRL and remember TRL <laughs> MTVs. And I, TRL I mean, one day TRL. I had videos on TRL. I got some VMA nominations. Yeah. I did. You know, I worked with. I did a massive Jessica Simpson video. The Fray. I went round the world with Jared Leto. And Thirty Seconds to Mars, and and it was as I, it was as good as a life as I was going to have in that business, mm-hmm. and I felt that for me, I didn't want to be an artist expressing myself in that yeah. that place for too long. I didn't love it. That's so I sort of yeah. I sort of transitioned into film. And so when you did when you took that first directing gig. When the when the the videos was it, or films on the music video with the fish and the the music yes. video salad, I loved it. Oh no, I loved that. So was that you took that. off from there and left the ading behind? I, I yeah, I went from making a fortune, what I think was a lot of money at the time, yeah. and having a really great lifestyle to not making anything. Huh. And with each step you take, you go down a little bit and then you go right back up. Yeah. You should never get too comfortable. I think it's the sort of lesson there. But yeah, I stepped, I stepped off, and then I started doing these born again Christian videos, and then I got, I did like, 
Hilary Duff, and then I did my Disney. I did my little run of Disney jobs where I was the guy you went to for every Disney video. And then, you know, and then I started getting better and better work. And then what happened was I got hired to do this movie, Love is the Drug, which is my favorite. It's not what addicted to our love. And I ran at it. I was just like, I'm going to do this. Yeah. And you, the, the thing that you, people don't tell you about making a film is that as a director, you are the engine. You are the pressure cooker. You are the, I'm going to make this. I'm going to do, I don't, and I, you go hell for leather. And that's the thing. I didn't look back. I didn't go, oh, I can't do this. I never mm. thought for a minute that I wasn't going to do this. So you just go 100%. Full I just commitment. didn't care. I didn't care about what, it's so it's such a difficult thing to do, but I just didn't care. I was like, you know what? We're all on our own path. I mean, you shouldn't care what I'm doing, and I'm not going to care about what you're doing. I'm just going to go for it. Yeah. And I went for I mean, I got to the point where the producers came to me and they said, we need someone like James Woods in the film because of help with the Sar- financing. Sarcastic so I said, I will find you James Woods. So I called my friend Marco Siega, who was a quite a big director at the time. He'd just done a movie with James Woods. And I said, oh. Marco, so I'm never going to tell anybody it was you, <laughs> but tell me where James Woods lives. Yeah. And he said he lives at the time. He doesn't live anymore. He's at the Lermitage Hotel on Burton Way. You didn't hear it from me. Click. <laughs> so I went down to the Lermitage Hotel. Did you? And I sat there. Wait from the cruise to the lobby. I sat there from five p.m. until eleven o'clock at night. Wow! And then I got up to leave. It's a true story. That's when he came in. And I'm like, all of a sudden, a car, a Jeep Grand Jeep Cherokee, pulled up, and James Woods sort of staggered out. He'd been playing poker. I said, James, I'm Elliot Lester. I have this script. I'm dying to talk to you. You don't owe me anything, but just like. Give me five minutes of your time. He's just like, what? Yeah. I'm like, just talk to me. He goes, well, hang on. Let me get, uh, sorry for my American accent. Let me get the dog. I got to take the dog for a walk. Let's get the, <laughs> let's, let's get the dog. We'll take the dog for a walk. <laughs> so come on, James come on. Woods and I, I wasn't kidding. Yeah. He, James Woods and I spent a lovely sort of like 45 minutes walking around the block, walking around with the dog. Classic Hollywood move. And, yeah. And he said, give me a script. I'll read it. And I'll do your movie. He couldn't make a deal, but uh, anyway. But hey, that's how you know far what? I... You tra- that's that's probably above and beyond what most people do to try to make the thing work. Well, you know, no one's handing it to you ever. I mean, I as you know, I have some very accomplished sort of director friends. And they all have similar stories yeah. about what they had to do to get their movie made. And that's, that's how far are you prepared to go? Anyway, so I made this film. We went to Sundance with it. Um, and, we, and it was kind of amazing. I don't know if I'd want to go through that again, but it was amazing. It's um, because it's sort of like, it's very easy to say, oh, you know, I went to Sundance, I had an amazing time, the film did great. Uh, yeah. And then come out, come out of it the other side and say, I don't ever want to do that again. But yeah. that was my first film. And I got an agent from that. I got a manager, got a good lawyer, did all, got it all right. Yeah. But I will tell you, there was a sort of naivety and an ignorance um, uh, which sort of helped me sort of propel forward. Mm. That I don't necessarily have that anymore. I'm not as naive about it anymore because I've done five or six films. Yeah. Well, you certainly went upward from there. I mean, it got better. I, <laughs> it did get better. Yeah. So I got, it's just how you, it's just how you want to just, you just want me to ramble. I'm happy to ramble. That's what I, want, I mean, but. I'll be honest with you. I, I have great interest in these things of, okay. of how, you know, and I can oh, the say steps? the steps, but, but the, you know, the, the minutia of like these little things that are, the glue that kind of holds together the bigger parts. So when, when you, when you hear about Elliot Lester, you hear about some of the magnificent work, but 
it's these little things in the middle. How did you, you know, you you going out and waiting for James Woods, and that that's a really interesting little because that's like the little nucleus between the between the bigger pieces that that shows. I just didn't care. You know. I just didn't care. So after that success, what happens is once you make a movie and people sort of like your movie, you get all these scripts that you don't want to make, and you do what's called the water. It's called the water bottle tour, and the water bottle uh, tour I've done many many times. And what it means is that you basically go around, you meet all these executives, all these studios, all these producers, and you sit in a sofa, they give you a bottle of water, and you talk about yourself for an hour. Maybe there's a project there, maybe there isn't. Um, But I had some heat. I had some heat. So I was given this script called Blitz, which was a blacklist script that had been written by Nathan Parker, who's Alan Parker's son. And Nathan at the time was also sort of like a first-time guy. And um, I went in and met the producers. The producers were, there was a guy called Brad Wyman who produced a movie called Monster with Charlize Theron. Anyway, Brad's a fan, he's still a friend, a fantastic producer. I went in, did my blah, blah, blah. Ah! <laughs> he said, and he was like, Brad had this thing, he would always twist his head. Like, okay, kid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're going to London. Uh. So, and in London was the studio, Lionsgate. Yeah. Um, so they flew me to London. Uh, I was totally jet lagged. I was out of my mind. I wasn't sure. I mean, even though I'm from London, I had no idea where I was going. Showed up in London, went in, did this sort of presentation, was just like, something must be up here. Anyway, was told I had the movie. Mm. I got the movie. Now, you when you get the movie... Right. You're like, hurrah! Yeah. But that's when the work starts because right. we had to get a cast and we had to um, sort of put it together. Yeah. So um, at the time, uh, they wanted Jude Law to play the lead. So I got a phone call from Brad, like, we're going to, we're going to New York! We're going to New York! <laughs> Flies me first class to New York. So you went to Jude Law's hotel and waited? Wait. No, I didn't have to do that. I had a meeting. <laughs> That's the difference between one first and yeah. second film. Yeah. Now, the, now they gotta come to you. So we're staying in the in the in this hotel called the Greenwich, my favorite hotel in New York, and then we go and see Jude Law to have a drink. And um, we go to the Gramercy Ho- Gramercy Park Hotel, which is quite a fancy hotel sit down Jude comes in and you know actors when you meet the movie stars when you meet them have a they glide he just glides in lychee martini lychee martini lychee martini <laughs> and we're getting wasted sure. we're getting wasted everything's amazing oh my god I'm like I'm light I'm lit up like you know you've got so, I'm doing your movie and when I'm like you are he's just like yeah I'm like this is incredible like you know shaking because I couldn't believe we were going to make this movie called my agent we got him. He's doing it. Anyway, so um, obviously that it didn't end up being Jude Law, right? It didn't end up being Jude Law. So what ended up happening was <laughs> I remember, I remember, I had to fly to London to meet Jude again, oh, and then Jude fell out. Jude yeah, fell out. Yeah. So then I get a call. Can you meet Jason Statham? I'm like, of course. I'm happy to meet Jason. I get a call to go to the Beverly Hills Hotel and I'm sat there with the head of the studio, Jason Statham, some other guy, and his manager. And I just remember it distinctly because I walked in. I I was like very prepared. I mean, like being slightly naive. I had all my ideas for the character and that kind of stuff. And I sat down and Jason's like this. Read your script. I'm like, yeah? Yeah. I'm in. (laughs) I'm like... What? Yeah, I'll do your movie. Great. All right. I turn to the head of the studio and I'm like, he goes, he goes, okay, you can go now. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, that's the end of the meeting. He's doing a movie. I'm like, all right, Jason, you want to give me a number or something? He gave me his phone number. Yeah. I texted him. He texted me back. I'm doing it. I'm so excited. I love your I love your impressions. By the way, I gotta say, I'm, I'm into it. I know you sounds like you're doing them just kind of like quickly, but they're funny. They're good. Odd. Yeah, I, he, um, so he, uh, 
he and I went off on this adventure to make glitz. Yeah. And I <laughs> I was making I was making something quite serious and I surrounded him with the best actors you could imagine. I had I don't know if you know Mark Rylance who won the Oscar for Bridge of Spies. I had Paddy Constantine, Aidan Gill. I had these the best of British actors. And one day he comes to me, he goes, Benny, come here. Well, what's that? I've got, to, I've got to talk to you. These guys, these actors you've got around me, you've got like Mark, Mr. Fucking Shakespeare, you've got Aidan Gillen, he's a fucking nutter. He goes, you go, they're all brilliant actors. I'm used to acting opposite a fucking hairdresser. Uh-huh. I was like, well, yeah, this is true. It might be the character. But you're a movie star, Jason. Yeah. You're a movie star. Yeah. Anyway. And cool. then we, we made the movie, and that was not easy. It wasn't easy. Because I had the studio, and it was nothing that I was used to. We made the movie. And, you know, it's funny. That movie was made maybe 10 years ago, mm-hmm. and the thing does not stop playing. Really? And Yeah, and it's interesting because, you know, as human beings, you're sort of conditioned over time to sort of forget all, all the bad things. Because a lot of bad things happened on that film, but a lot of good things happened on it. Like, you know. And um, <clears throat> the thing that was amazing about that was that over time you just forgave all of them and you just love, <clears throat> I just love the film. Yeah. But, but, um, it sort of scarred me, that one, and I, w- I went into director's jail off of that film. I couldn't really? get a job. Yeah. I don't know the backstory on, on Blitz, and you don't have to, you don't have to go into it, but. Um, well, we can't just have all. We can't. We can't just talk about our successes. That that's that that would be that wouldn't be honest. Well, I've, I've it's heard not like, about that. Hey, I went from here to there. <laughs> that's not, I've that's heard not about a, a couple other people. You know where things get heated and there's arguments and stuff, and it ends up on set between bigger name people, and it turns into the. You know, you can't get work we because of, we had, we had a, we had a bit of that. Um, we had a bit of that. What happened afterwards was I um, the movie was very difficult for me, which I don't need to go into. Sure, but ultimately benefited me because the movie is regarded as one of Jason's best films, which is great. And, you know, it plays. If the thing didn't play, I'd be like, okay, but it plays constantly, yeah. all the time. Do, and then, do yeah, you believe I in? Uh, do you believe in the thinking where it's it's like all about the film, and if as long as the film is great. Then that's the that's what matters. Is that your? I think that's that's the only way. That's the only thing you should be thinking about. Everything else is distraction. You know, those lunches, those expensive lunches and dinners that you go to with the agents and the managers and the lawyers and the t- that means nothing. It's when you're on set and you've made a choice of where to put the camera and the story you're going to tell and the way you're asking the actor to perform. That's the only thing that matters. Who cares about the lunches and dinners? Really? You can only eat one lunch at a time, so it doesn't matter if it, if it's at Medeo. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, like, to uh, me, it doesn't matter. I wish I could, I wish a, I could do a virtual fist bump for that one, buddy. That's, I'm, is, I'm with you. Right. Let's try it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, and, as I, and to, to speak to that, as the more work I made, what, what became more important was the work. What yeah. became less important was the sort of, nomenclatura and hanging out with the, with the you know the cool kids it didn't really matter so anyway I was in director's jail and I couldn't get a job yeah. and when you're in director's jail you don't know you're in director's jail mm. you have no idea right no one comes you to you and says here's the deal you just don't understand why the communication is slowing down I had a very good manager I still have the same manager and one of the reasons I stayed with him was because he was honest and he said, you know what? You're in jail. This is what it feels like. We've got to get you out of it. So <clears throat> what, was your, what was your route? What was your plan to sort of realize? Well, I, I, it, was, it was actually really simple, and it was all material driven. So I had a friend called Josh Weinstock who's a producer, and he'd reached out to me. And he, I think he at the time was having a hard time. And he goes, hey, listen, you know, let's talk. Let's meet. We met and we said, I said, yeah, it's pretty really hard right now. I can't seem to find my focus or whatever. He's like, okay, well, let me think about it. A week later, he comes to me with a script for Nightingale. And he said, what do you think of this? I, and I read it. I said, this is incredible. Is this real? He goes, yeah. I said, you know what? 
meet me at the art my office tomorrow. I was working out Bandito Brothers at yeah. the time, who are big directors who aren't anymore. And, um, Sad. I love that place. I love that place. It was beautiful. It was yeah. beautiful. Just wasn't it the energy wasn't was it great. Amazing. Something about it's being amazing. inside that office because it wasn't. It didn't feel like an office. It felt like a like a like a uh, creative conglomerate so sad because places like that don't exist like yeah. right now everywhere else is like anyway. glass and and secretaries yeah. and stuff so uh we acted as if we were making the movie we yeah. faked it till we made it and we yeah. had we met with financiers we had actors come in come out and then finally this actor walked in called david yellowo and the meeting we had with him was transcendent. It was like nothing I'd ever felt. Mm. I felt his passion, his commitment. I felt he was honest. He wasn't a big name at the time. I think he was like sort of struggling to sort of um, get there. And I looked at him and I was just like, this is a guy. And we went off. I raised the money. It wasn't a lot of money. And it was one of the most beautiful experiences I ever had making a film. It was, you know, if you could, it was, everything was perfectly synced up. Um, the shooting, the location, the crew was the best, one of the best crews I've ever worked with. My the friend, the DP who shot it, Peter Vermeer was a very close friend of mine. It was his first film. So we made this film and we finished it. And the film, I still, is one of my favorite things I've done. So you got yourself out of jail. You've you you made you've you. Well, I had Josh, your own Josh, way out. Josh, Josh. I found my. You have to find your people. Yeah. You know, because the thing is, the business is fickle. Everyone likes you one minute, then they'll turn on you five seconds later, and you're just like, I'm still the same person. Yeah. I was still the same filmmaker. Well, rather than um, fi- asking someone or, or waiting for someone to create something for you or hand you something, you just developed your own way to move forward, which is. That's kind of what this whole podcast embodies is people that find their own Well, you way. have to, you have to. Here's the thing. It's great when you get an agent. It's great when you get a manager. It's great that you take those meetings, but you are not going to do it unless you are grinding every day. It just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You have to have that focus. I get up every morning. If I haven't got a script to read, I'm developing projects. I'm not developing projects. I'm selling projects. If I'm not selling projects. I'm walking off a of project. <laughs> if I'm not walking off, then I'm reengaging on something. I mean, it's constantly finding to keep... something to move forward on. Yeah. Now, if one day I wake up, I always had this thing where even when I was younger, I'm going to do one thing every day towards my career. Like and that. every day I do something towards my career, whether it's read a script call a producer, make a new relationship. But that was the thing. And I, that's how I, li- I lived that way. Anyway, so Nightingale, finished Nightingale, Nightingale, Brad Pitt, Dee Dee Gardner, Jeremy Kleiner at Plan B, see it. They come on as producers. And my life changed in that moment when I got, I got a phone call saying, can you come to the Plan B office? And I showed up and Brad Pitt was there to greet me. And I sat with Brad for three hours. And he told me about what he felt, how he felt about my film. He told me how the film was going to be released. He goes, we're going to sell this to HBO this week. We're going to have an awards campaign for David. Just wow. watch. You got a horsepower behind that thing all of a sudden. It was, it was like nothing I have ever seen in my life. It literally went from... Because we were turned down by every film festival, by the way. Really? We were turned down by everywhere. And the moment Brad Pitt got involved in Plan B, the narrative changed. So it started off like Sundance didn't want the film, Toronto, Venice, nobody wanted the film. And it ended up winning the Critics' Choice, all these Image Awards, got Emmy nominations, got Golden Globe nominations, you know, the only thing we didn't get were Oscar nominations because we couldn't enter the Oscars. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it was there were you know I remember just driving driving around LA and there were bu- posters on the sides of buses with the film on, and that sort of nice sort of gratification. Yeah, like you said earlier, you know, things go down, but they always come up higher. 
you have to keep that. It doesn't I mean listen. What's the lowest you're gonna the lowest you're gonna fall is up to you. It's up to you. Um, and remember how you feel about how you feel is not how things are. Yeah, it's very yeah. very different. Yeah. So look, I was sort of riding high. I was. Yeah. I mean, I was sort of the. I mean, then I was like, I worked with Matt Damon, and then you know all kinds of. But I wasn't seeing great material. I still wasn't seeing great material. You know, everybody wanted... So I did Water Bottle Tour number three. <laughs> everybody wanted a me. Everyone wanted a thing. And then it was still like, okay, what am I going to do next? And then, you know, I took a film because I wanted to be on set. Yeah. Which I think was a mistake. That oh, was a mistake. Yeah. You just wanted to work. I wanted to be on set. And in yeah. doing that... I think had I been a little more patient with myself, um, I wouldn't have made that next film. But I made it and lived with it. It went on to go to festival. Is that uh, Sleepwalker? Sleepwalk, Sleepwalker, yeah. Which was sort of like, you know, I like I like that film for reasons, but I don't love that film. I can't mm-hmm. say it's my finest work. <laughs> it's not who I. It's not who I am. It's not who I am. Yeah. And then, but I, in the interim, I was selling lots of TV shows. I was working. I, do you I was do you do a lot television. of writing and and selling your writing when and detaching from? I'm it? not a writer. Oh no, I work on. with writers. I'm not a writer. I think I think that the thing is look, that much I can tell you. I'm not. I'm not. That's not my strength. But my strength is development. My strength is like, you know, I can find good writers, put them yeah. on, yeah. and hopefully hopefully the scripts work. I mean, yeah. I've sold four or five shows to HBO. I've just sold a show to CBS, a network show. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm developing something else. I have three films, and one I'm casting right now. Um, I have another one that I have with Peter Dinklage that I'm doing hopefully early next year when we get back online. Yeah. Has the has this whole pandemic thing? What what has it slowed down in your life, and what has it sped up? Effects. Um, I was overall? two days away from shooting a movie, and we were shut down oh, back in March. Two days. We were, I was in Spain, and it was like we're, we're shutting you down. I like, okay, yeah. uh, it slowed everything down. I mean, and I'd be a liar to tell you if it hadn't. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like. Um, but it's also been quite nice because if you've worked for, tw- I don't know about you, but I've worked for 25 years straight. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's okay to have a few months yeah. off. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's okay. I, it was, I was going full speed. I, last year was really, really busy to begin this year. It's really weird how this year ramped up a lot. I was saying no to stuff, you know, what were and you doing? Set decoration. Right. Art department. Were you doing TV or film? What was your sort of? Uh, there was. A, I did one. I did one film that was shot the LA portion of it uh, here at the end of the year last year, uh, and then it was all TV this year until March thirteenth, which was a Friday. TV is a grind. TV is a grind for set decoration, art department stuff. It's it's. TV is actually kind of a good medium. Oh, because you only have so many sets that you're dressing. Well, it's consistent. So you're not like a commercial is great. I love commercials and that's what's been available now with the pandemic stuff. But TV, you know, the commercial might be a better income, but it's sparse. So the TV is, you might get, you might make a little less money, but you consistently get your, right. So, um, and yeah, depending on the show, it can be just a little less backbreaking, a little less tough. You know, you're not giving out, you're not putting out 150% effort for the same paycheck you could put out for 90% of the effort. And I'm not trying to say that I'm lazy. It's just, you you know, 12 to 14 hour a day. <laughs> the crew, you know, I'm on the, I'm on the crew side. So we try to look for that situation where we don't have to kill ourselves to get the paycheck, you know? We're still going to put the effort out. I'm going to give the, the the quality. It's just you know you don't want to like go home with uh, needing chiropractic work every weekend. You know, 
So TV is kind of that thing. But then again, I've done a, I've done, I've done a bit of TV. TV, I, 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 TV's that's it's you're in and you're grind. I find that it was a real grind. Yeah, you know, um, it's strangely like different. It's so it's so oddly different Complete. than film. Well, it is for the director because yeah. you're not originating. Invariably, you're not originating the work, and the DP's already set the look. Yeah, the writers have all the power, and the actors know their characters. So you're sort of you've got to basically be a very good house guest when you're directing yeah. television. Strange. That's what you, I've never understood. Sort of, it almost just seems like a political move to keep directors coming in every week on TV. I mean, I I'm sure there's that aspect to it, but if if we're talking about fundamentally being creative, it's not the right medium unless you're directing the pilot. If you yeah. fundamentally want to be creative yeah. and you want to have a voice, you pick film. Yeah. Because that's the, the most expressive movie. I've only worked on a few films. In fact, I worked on a... Jared Leto was doing a... Uh, I forget what the character... or the. I forget the name of it, to be honest with you. At the end of last year, they shot... It was shot in London, but they shot the L.A. Morbius. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. The movie. And... Um, do you talk the, to Jared? Not really. But he's a fascinating guy. He was very nice to everybody. He is, but it's fun. that's his thing. He is quite he's quite sweet. Quite sweet and, but the difference between he was that great and, to me. Yeah. He was great to me. When you were doing yeah, the music video stuff. So. Did you work with him on yeah, everything? I mean, we, we went to China yeah. for a couple of months. And we went to China and then we went to the North Pole. And the thing wow. about Jared is that he would take you on these incredible adventures and the adventures were amazing i mean like we i mean where are where in my life am i going to be helicoptered and landing on an iceberg in the middle of the sort of north pole and that's for a music video for 30 seconds of March? yeah it was a, a beautiful light it was just wow. amazing and his his sort of ambition was second to none and yeah. focus so fo hyper focused and I had a really great, I had a really great time with him. And he, uh, we did, we did two, and then he called me for another one, and I couldn't do it. I was in Paris, I couldn't do it. But I just, I had, uh, you know, the work was always great, but the adventure was even better. I fully like, agree. Wow, where where are we going now? Yeah. The places, I'm, I've, I'm not a director, but even, even I get to go to some pretty unique places just because you're part of the crew and you end up. Shooting somewhere. Burbank, Van Nuys, <laughs> Silma. To be honest with you, some Silma. of these, like, so, you know, you, like, go to some insane house. <clears throat> you know, you're at a house in, like, the Palisades or something, and there's a little secret, like, door to this secret basement. And you're just like, room? what the fuck is this? And, like, and it opens, and then you see there's guns down there, and you're like, holy shit. And you're like, you don't know these places exist. You're in this guy, you're in somebody's house. I don't know whose house this is. Strange. It's it, and, and there's no, it's like carte blanche. It's like you can go everywhere you want because you're got, you're part of the crew. Yeah, and, you have the, that's the thing, you have film immunity. That's yeah, the other thing. Film, I, yeah, I remember film. like, I would walk as an AD when I had film immunity. I would walk out in the middle of the street and stop traffic. <laughs> <laughs> like, you will not pass through me. You, you will shall not, not pass. pass. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it sort of heightens your level of confidence yeah. to uh, beyond. You become sort of like a superhero. Yeah, yeah. The privilege of being on a set. So I, 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 like you're saying, you wanted to be on set. It's it's attractive and it's fun. It's hard work, but it's it's a it's a fun environment, and it's, and there's creativity there if, if you're lucky, and um, you'd want to be a part of that group. Yeah, you want to be with the cool. You want to be with the cool kids. Yeah, I am. Um, so my last, the my last movie I did was I got a call. I was sh actually shooting some television at Lance, and I got a call from Baron Aronofsky Ooh. asking me asking me if I wanted to come and do this movie with him and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Oh, yeah. After my, um, I'm hoping that a, very, very, an Arnold Schwarzenegger impression is coming. Are we get... <laughs> Arnold and I are we are very I, I we're very good friends and cool. pretty close. Yeah, we still see each other every we see each other quite regularly. Um, I have to say that I have never enjoyed anyone as much as I've enjoyed him. Really, 
he is he is unique. Huh. He treats everybody the same. Mm. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a, a valet or you're a, a Warren Buffett, you are treated exactly the same. And he's incredibly gen- generous and gracious and has been nothing but so kind to me. And mm. to direct him was just a joy. I, there yeah. was never, he'd be like, you know, I remember going to have lunch with him in Brentwood and he was just like, okay, so, you know, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to fly, fly out to see you in we're shooting in Ohio. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to go and we're going to survey the set. We're going to walk around the set, and I'm going to take on the personality. Oh. He goes, and then we're going to shoot our movie. <laughs> and every night we'll drink schnapps in victory. Oh I was God. just like, I yes, Conan, yes, Conan. <laughs> Dude, and he I, just tells great. He tells great that's stories. Great. He goes, you know, I was the guy who the governor of California. You know, and uh, he just everything was a great story, and everything yeah. he lives his life. Now, here's the thing: there is no regret with him. He doesn't look back on his life. <coughs> he doesn't. There's no. You know, he's he's had great successes and huge failures, but he'll he talks about the failures and successes with the same. Uh, the same respect. He taught me something about uh, visualization as well, mm. which is something he's really big on. He's yeah. like, you know, okay, because do you, do you visualize your life and you, you put together a little mood board and you put the photos of the house that you want to live in and, the, and he goes, I do that every day and I visualize it. You know? Yeah. And and he does that. You know, I can be honest with you, the, um, being a sort of a latch, latchkey kid that was grew up like kind of coming of age in the late eighties, early nineties, his movies. And I'm, I'm a fan of like cheesy action and it was probably his movies probably had the biggest effect on me as I was. Why? Because, because as a, he was like, they were companion pieces to you for your life. That's probably a good way to put it. It, it allowed me to kind of re- let go of the fact that I was, you know, I didn't enjoy school. So I'd come home and watch mm. a movie and, and it was a different time, you know? So you didn't see social media or anything. You just get like a, you see the movie trailer, you see it on TV a couple of times and you just go to the movie and it was, it was a, a bigger experience and it allowed me and probably has something to do with my personality is just enjoying that like absurd reality that would be created in his films and it was fun it was an escape and uh you know i liked a lot of films but his stood out in my in my youth his stood out uh, commando and in total recall and predator i mean i just those films stood out in my memory so strong um what was that when he did red um red heat Red Heat. My friend directed, Walter Hill directed um, Red Heat, and Walter's a very close friend of mine. And I remember talking to him about it. I said, so, you know, he's just like, you know, the thing is about Arnold is <laughs> like you can see him sitting on a tank driving forward. Yeah. But, the, but the, thing, the thing that you probably took maybe from those films, I don't know, he was having the most fun out of everybody. He... I mean, I can tell you, never late to set, knew his lines, hit his marks, fantastic with the other actors, and just was enjoying his life. It was just like, you know, I think he had this sort of philosophy, or does have this philosophy, like, if you're here, you might as well have a good time. Do you know what I mean? Like, what's yeah. the point of staying inside being miserable? You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Everything, everything is possible. He, remember, he came here with no money. Yeah. He's a sort of true immigrant story. So yeah, absolutely. I had, a wonderful, I had a wonderful experience with him. I had a wonderful time actually making that film. And that film, I think, is rated as one of his best performances that he's yeah. given. The film is yeah. a very dark, melodramatic film. It's unapologetic, um, and I and I sort of, I sort of secretly love every aspect of that film. Yeah. Um, but what's next is what matters. Yeah. What's next is, is, is what matters. I've never, I never, I haven't done shit, sort of hugely commercial stuff. Um. And maybe I won't. I don't know. Yeah. 
Do you ever feel? Do you ever feel any feelings like uh, when you were ading and you said, "I just can't keep going"? Do you get fed up with directing? Are you? Do you love the entire process? Is there part of it you just? I never get of... fed up to directing with the job. Never. I yeah. never hated directing. Do I get fed up with the process of getting a job, setting a job up? Yeah, of course. It's relentless. But it's also my choice. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, look, I'm not, I'm, I'm not in, living in Vietnam working in a shoe factory. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm living in a, a nice home and have fulfilled a lot of my goals like that. There's not many people that can say that. Yeah, yeah. I get fed up with the process. I get, I get a little bit. Uh, what I'm getting, what I get a little bit tired of is the chatter, <clears throat> you know, and the sort of hype around new, great, me, gotta go and get this person. Oh, you gotta go. Like, you know, it's like, yeah. Um, I get tired of that. Yeah. Because it's not real. It's not. It's not. It's not real. But at the, at the I mean, where else? Um, where else can you have a job in your life where you get to show up on set, take a bunch of like sociopaths and narcissists, throw them all together in a salad and go, okay, you're going to be this character and you're this character and you're that. And where, I mean, oh, yeah. the it's, uniqueness. A, it's the, yeah. it's the circus and it's yeah. fantastic. It is a fantastic job. It, yeah. Getting, getting the work is really, that can be very hard. Getting financing for films that you're crazy passionate about. And, yeah. But you gotta, what are you gonna do? Not try? Not right. try. Yeah. I mean, if you didn't do that and you did do the job that's difficult that you didn't love, you'd still be working hard at something. So you may as well work hard at this. Well, that was the other thing when, uh, when I was a first AD. I wasn't getting any credit. Uh, it was sort of like an overpaid dead end job. You know what I mean? In the, as much as, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's an honourable job being an AD, but the stress level was so so much for so little. It was like this is crazy. Yeah. You know what? What you would do is I remember I would get up at five a.m. in the morning. I put my boots on, and by the time I put my boots on, got on, stepped on set, I was stepping off set and getting back in the car because the days would go so quickly. Wow. But there was no sort of reward. Yeah. I felt like that too sometimes where you're just trading time for money. Well, yeah, I mean, it's also, what also you're trading is your opportunity. Yeah. Like, you know, every time you do the job that you're doing and not loving it, you are, you know, outside of providing for your family, you are giving up on an opportunity of doing what you love. I don't know how your day is. Do you have a routine? It's, there's routine and then the, you know, there's chunk, like the start and stop of it are kind of the routine, but the day itself is, it's up in the air what it could be. I mean, it generally is the same, but. You get, I, are you grateful? Do you get absolutely. Up you in fact, I do like right. that things change. I don't want to have the same routine every day. I want to, I want to, I want to not know where I'm going to be in two weeks working. I prefer that. You know, yeah. Then. Minute by you go moment by moment. Yeah. The other thing, the other thing is with creativity is the thing I found the hardest is if you force it, it won't. It doesn't come. The moment you turn the volume down on it, you'll find that the inspiration sort of comes to you, mm. and the inspiration will come to you in the most. Oh, you could be in a car wash. You could be, you know, in the, the frozen food section in the in the supermarket but that will come yeah. but if all you're doing is you're so raw, if you're so raw tight and I gotta get it I gotta get it I gotta get it you're not allowing anything to come to you yeah I agree yeah. I completely agree with that I've had a lot you've of inspirational see- moments when I'm not trying to search for them you know you're doing something else you've got to let the universe take care of you that's that's yeah. the thing I always say to people, like, I mean, look, just to speak to where we are with COVID and pandemic and uh, loss of earnings and all that sort of stuff, you've got to ask the people you know, have they ever missed a meal? There's very few people that you know who've ever not had somewhere to sleep or some food to eat. True. So you're getting getting what you need. Everything else right now is just sort of like a bonus. You're lucky you're back at work. And then I've got other friends who are back at work. You know, they'll soon get fed up with that. They'll get bored with it. Yeah. They'll complain. They'll start complaining. 
I have to tell myself every day when it's when you're just tired and just like I'd rather I'd rather have this opportunity than be searching for it. We got to keep pushing forward and do a good job because it's I don't want to be somewhere else. You know, as much as it's tough sometimes and it's a lot of work, I, I, I that's where I want to be. You know? What um. What do the other creatives you talk to? What do they? What do they say? What are the sort of? Is there any sort of anything that sort of unifies us in terms of a common sort of thread? Yeah, it's it's that um, it's that desire and drive to do that thing that's not just you know a, a clear path. So you know you couldn't do what you're doing and interact with the people you're interacting with by just going to a four-year college and getting a degree, a degree and applying for a job. You have to go wait in hotel lobbies yeah. and meet people and, and create stuff and, 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 and network and that kind of thing to do that. You, but it's your drive. It's the drive behind the person that comes from here. That's the thing that's it's unique to everyone but similar in the sense that we all do it, you know? You know, I find really sad, and I've got some friends who've done this, when they give up. They go, oh, this is too hard, I'm going to give up. And you're just like, why? You don't need to give up. Yeah. That's the time to double down. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just keep, like, sort of, yeah. for, for, keep for, forging ahead. Um, you know, I've had friends who sort of, like, they gave up, and they ended up working in a prop house, you know, for five or six years, or they sort of became realtors and, you know, mortgage brokers. And they're honorable trades, but it's just like, wow, you really you could, if you'd have made, maybe if you'd have hung on a couple more months, you'd have had that moment of inspiration and just gone for it. Mm -hmm. You know, trust me, there isn't a creative that you're going to talk to that doesn't have um, that moment where they think they should give up. Everyone does that. Yeah. I've had, it, I've had it, the thought. I've had that thought, but I've got the thought that's stronger is that I don't want to be anywhere else. I'm like, I can't go get a job somewhere else. I just can't. It's just not an option. I have to find a way. And, and it's what's just, your goal? To be honest with you, I want to direct, but I it's it takes, you know. What's stopping um, you? It's easier now than ever. I, can, I don't have an answer for you. You have one of these? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. What do you need? Yeah, I, I agree. I don't have an excuse other than I've taken up. Do you have an idea? Do you have an idea of something that you want to do? Yeah, I've got some. Little... Yeah, I've been working on some things. Yeah. Is it? Are you are you starting out with something short and small? A uh, little, uh, little TV pilot. Yeah. My first boss is still my friend, and my first boss. When I was a PA, he said to me, he was saying, ah, he goes, he was like, get out of this PA business. This isn't good for you. He said, go out and shoot stuff. Just shoot anything. You're going to make so many mistakes. You're going to fail. You can just get out there and shoot something. It's not until you get out there and you try it that you, and I'm not being condescending. I'm just trying, I'm trying to. No, I'm listening to you. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you're going to be benefiting your life if you don't take that first step. And that's really up to you. Because if I think about my first step, I didn't think I'd end up getting awards and making films with, with big movie stars. I never thought that. I thought I was just going to make these videos. But you just don't know. Unless you take that first step, you're not going to know. But I, I encourage you to take that first step. And don't... It's almost like try to just shoot something... Small. See if you like it. Mm -hmm. You've got to know if you like it. You know? Mm -hmm. It's like gaffers that become cameramen. You know? Yeah. They become cameramen because they take that first step. Yeah. Um, like you I, can, I, there's nothing stopping you. I mean, right now, you just get, pick up... Look, I don't make short films, right? But... If I if I was starting my career now, I would grab an actor and I go shoot them. I do a monologue. Just just get them on the lens, talking to you, saying yeah, something, yeah. direct them. You know, and you might be surprised. Yeah. Whenever you sort of like, whenever you take, when I, I, I say whenever you take, whenever you take a step, 
towards what you want, you're, you, you're, you build your confidence. You know, you've got to stay away from the, the doubt. I mean, <laughs> what, you need, the... what you need to create is actually very simple. I agree. I've taken too many opportunities to work and get a paycheck. And, in fact, I had plans to open up a little window of time and then, you know, excuses, excuses, and COVID and everything. But What time? What do you need? You need a day to film something. Yeah. You need a day. Yeah. You need a, you need a day. What it is, is the concept. If you're, if you're, the thing is, you might, what you might be, I can't speak for you, but if your concepts are too big, you know, there's a famous um, uh, filmmaker called Bresson who said, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, if you can't do it with the minimum, you'll never be able to do it with the most. So if you can't do it with camera, actor, and dialogue, why do you think you're going to be able to do it with, you know, a Transformer star budget? Start, start cultivating your craft. Yeah. The thing that was great about being an AD was that I learned set etiquette. I learned where to put the camera. I learned how you could do things. I learned techniques, you know, and you sort of learn them by osmosis. Yeah. You know, if at the time we had an iPhone and I could get and I'd point the camera at you and I'd go, oh, Alex, stop crying, stop crying, laugh, joke, tear your hair out. <laughs> it was, I'd maybe have been a director quicker. Yeah. Yeah, there's absolutely no excuse. Uh, yeah. There's no I, excuse. I'd, be, I'd, be real, I'd probably be fair to say there's a, a bit of, uh, I guess, fear of 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 going down that road because of, you know, God knows you haven't what. Gone down, but you haven't gone down it. How do you know? Right. right. What are you trying to sort of self-fulfilling, have a self-fulfilling prophecy of failure? That's not, that's not no, realistic no. because you're, you're the, it's a, it's, it's not real. Yeah. Like that's anxiety. It's not, we yes. all, by the way, we all get performance anxiety. Every time I show up to set, I get a little bit of, <gasps> and then I'm like, ah, yeah getting the job yeah but that's up to you well i mean you're not get, you're not getting younger don't be surprised if you start getting messages from me about asking for advice then you know what <laughs> truthfully that's not a problem i get that all the time yeah. i get guy i get the most random stuff i got this guy from gujarat reach out to me you know i saw something you made but, uh, can you give me some advice and I get that a lot, and I always, if I can, I have the time. I always engage. I always engage because it doesn't doesn't sort of take it doesn't it doesn't take any time for me to sit down and talk to somebody for like five minutes. Yeah. And say, all right, here's a little bit of wisdom. Maybe it'll work for you. Maybe it won't. It's sort of your obligation. It's sort of like your duty as a as a filmmaker who's made stuff to do that. Yeah. The other thing I learned was never. Kick the assistant. Always be nice to the assistant. Because <laughs> they turn out you to will be, be the next. Because they're going to be you yeah. in five years. Yeah. You know, I learned that. Don't worry about the establishment. Worry about the guys coming up because that's who you're going to work for. Yeah. I, I, what is I in, learned what that. What is that basement? What is that room, by the way? What is in that room? Oh, it's just my garage. Yeah. It's 1978 your birth year. Oh, my God, you got terminated. I've just caught that. You got terminated. Yeah. <laughs> and you like, told you. Don't do it. Come on, get to the chopper. Here, ready? Get ready? To the chopper. Let me give you some more. Uh, What's going on? <laughs> I got. What's going I, on? I got him on lock here. Hi, honey. How are you? <laughs> the best. I'm telling you. I, I I want I want to say I appreciate your advice because it's it's strong coming from somebody who has done these things. You know, and it's 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 encouraging to talk to someone who's and I look up to filmmakers. I've always looked up to filmmakers because my my little spark, you know, that started with me. I was watching. I think I was it was too early. I was watching uh, John Carpenter's The Thing. And I'm scared and I'm, I'm confused and in these disgusting things are happening with the puppeteer but it looked real and i didn't know what it was and it scared me you know and but it's it's it planted a seed and i said to myself i said there's something there you know and so 
I've always looked up to film and people that make films as just these ultimate creative geniuses that, you know, make, you know, it's cliche, but you makes this sort of their, make their dreams come true. You know what they imagine. They sort of create that on screen. And that's the most fun thing. It's the most fun thing to me. And I think it's probably the most fun thing to people that love movies and want to make movies is, is creating something that has an effect on people. And when you have that effect on people, I mean, that's kind of the bottom line when it really comes down to you're paying for a ticket or whatever is, you know, you want to have an effect on people. Well, we love stories. I mean, that's a sort of in our genealogy. We sort yeah. of like people love stories. They want to hear something new. They want to learn something new. And that's sort of like it's a campfire tradition, you know, and I suppose all the a film is is an extension of that. You know, it's an yeah. extension of like the campfire. Um but more back to you, I, 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 there isn't a reason for you not to do something. I agree. Start with something simple. Though. I, you know, just start, with, start yeah. with something simple. It can be very frustrating. It can be very frustrating because you sort of like, you you know, when you first start out, you need this sort of breakthrough, you know. But you'll find the more you do it, the easier it gets. I mean, it's sort of easier it gets. Well, that your your like your advice with just the monologue, just taking some little short piece of of a story that someone can deliver that doesn't require three sets and effects or anything. It's just acting and and some easy no, editing. It's just, yeah, you've yeah. got to see if you can convey, you know, uh, you've got to com- see if you can convey the emotions that you're trying to elicit from the actor. You know, that takes a skill in itself. You'll yeah. see that people will treat you differently. And you'll feel differently about yourself once you've done it. You, 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 you know. Remember, you have your, you'll have your, you'll discover that you have your, your voice and your signature. And then what I would say is, that, you know, part of the other thing about the business side of it, the chatter side of it, is that they sort of reduce directors, writers to sort of, sort of like noxious beasts that they were sort of commodities. Mm-hmm. But we're not really, you know, we're all sort of unique. We all have a different story. I mean, like the guy that sort of writes Copland is very different from the guy that writes Thor Ragnarok. Yeah. You know, they're all sort of unique people. Yeah. Um, you sort of got to respect, you got to respect that. But I would, I would, yeah, if I were you, I would just pick up that thing and go, there's so many actors that will give to you. Yeah. yeah. Give you their time. Absolutely. You know, Actually, you I was do, just, you know, I was noticing on a couple of these Facebook pages that I, I'm a, I'm, part of where they're actor director people and they are posting on there right now to your point is there's they're posting on there i'm available to do fun Anything. let's let's go make something yeah. you know and I mean, why don't you take you know something it's very interesting you said earlier the story you were telling me about um uh you being a latchkey kid and mm. only watching arnold schwarzenegger films and, yeah. you know I think it would be interesting if what you did was you did a, a short film about a kid who has an imaginary friend who thinks is Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's funny. And, and he, yeah. he would come home and uh, anytime he would have a problem, he would Arnold Schwarzenegger would be sort of guiding him through his life. You know, you could do the dishes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that's good. And that's an, and that's just, That would just be a kid and voiceover. That's funny. Or you, or you could just take the best lines from his movies and, um, Come on, Billy, do your homework. Your yeah, mother that will be kind proud of, stuff. of you. Get in there. You know, yeah. I mean, like, I'm not. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I just no, I know. I just, I love it. I love the idea. It's funny. It's a funny little yeah. short, you know, little f- short comedy fun idea. My best friend Arnold, you know. Or something. Yeah. And it's by the way, as innocuous as it sounds, it's some. It's a place to sort of start from. Right? Yeah. Very true. Okay. Well, so what else do we do? What else should we dig into? Because it, it's time know. for me to get on the peloton. Yeah. <laughs> and keep uh, the noggin going. Yeah, I mean, we can keep going if you want. I I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, it's up to you. I mean, where are we at? Up to you. Hour and a half. We've had a good. We've done a good hour and a half, man. Yeah. It's up to you. However, you want to take the next. If, where do you want to take it? Why don't we do this? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, let's do another one. Will you come back? Pleasure, of course. Okay. When you may, I'll, I'll come back. 
If the next time I speak, yeah. if the next time I speak to you, you have written the first three pages of your script about Arnold and you. Uh, Arnold and me. I'll make you a promise. If you write that, I'll ask him to read it for you. Oh my god. Oh, uh, so just I, I didn't say I didn't, no, I didn't I, say he's going to say yes, just the, just the and fact I didn't that say he's going to do it. Just the but fact that you said that I will. Is amazing. I will ask him, and I don't think you need much more incentive than that. Oh wow! I, I don't have a choice. It has to it has to happen. Jesus. Great. Should we give you a de- should we give you a deadline as well? <sighs> yeah. Let's, let's do, do a deadline. Let's do, do a deadline. What do you want it to okay. be? Because writers writers work with a deadline. I think you should have at least three or four pages of this written by the second week in October. Second week, October. So what I'm going to suggest that you do is, first of all, do your outline. Okay. Outline the story. Don't overcomplicate it. Keep it to a page or so. <laughs> Write who the character is. Mm-hmm. Write the relationship he has he comes home every day. You know the relationship. He comes home every day. He's a kid. He's alone. Mummy and daddy are never there. Everything's like he goes to the fridge, drinks his milk, has some cookies, whatever. And he's just so completely alone in the house. But then one day he wakes up and the poster of Arnold starts talking to him. And he realizes that he's you know, maybe he's being bullied at school. And he knows that no one can bully him now because he has the Terminator who's going to defend him. I'm writing a script for you. Yeah, I'm writing all these notes down. <laughs> it's going. You know what I mean? Yeah. And also, the other thing is write what you know. You know what I mean? Write what you know. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, don't, you know, if you know about that character, that's the easiest place for you to start. I mean, think about how that movie opens. You know, you're walking home from walking home from school. You're walking home from school. Um, you know, maybe some of the kids have bullied you a little bit, and you walk in, the door opens. Mom, uh, uh. And there's no, there's nothing that shouts back to you. Yeah, you go into your, you know, I mean, it's a little bit sad, a little simpatico. You have to have that contrast then at sure. the beginning of the character so feeling a little feel bit sad, me. and then, yeah, and then sort of that character is really sad, and then it sort of gets his strength back. And then you never hear anyone's voice in the movie apart from Arnold. <laughs> and maybe the bully when he says something to the kid on the way home, but not the kid. I think I think what you do is, I think what you do is you. The only voice you hear is Arnold's all the way through the film until the very end of the film, and you see the kid say something. I am Terminator, you know, or something. Yeah, to turn the bully away. Well, no, however you want to construct it. I think that would be a nice moment. Is this going on the podcast? Absolutely. (laughs) Really? We're just creating. We're just creating. Anyway, that's the thing. Also, uh, it's also, I've always found this, it's really, I'm not a writer, but you sort of, if you can bounce with people, it's, it's. That's, um. Offline, I would love to get your mind to sort of hear this other uh, thing I got. <clears throat> With pleasure. Yeah. I, you know, I don't work very well in a vacuum. I don't know about you, but when you have some, you know, mm-hmm. the writer's room type of feel, when you've got that other person or that other entity mm-hmm. to sort of. I'm not a writer. Things. I'm not a writer, but the writers I work with, it depends on the writer. Yeah. Like, I found some writers can dig in and say, no, this is how it's going to be. And when they do that, um, the work is usually crap. Mm. I love the interaction. Sort of I love to say something yeah, and I, someone says, I don't get it, and you move on, or they laugh, and you've, it, it, all of it starts to kind of blend and, and mesh. That, to well, me, is let great. Let me know what you need. Let me know, let me know what you need. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Cool, man. But anyway, look, I'm, I think I'm going to run. Yeah. Elliot, I really, really appreciate your time. Did you want to? Uh, did you want to throw anything out there for people to check out that you'd like people to see? I mean, you know, uh, I mean, any of the movies: Nightingale, Sleepwalker, Aftermath, Blitz, 
addicted to her love. They're all, they've all been distributed all around. You know, my next movie is The Thicket with Peter Dinklage, Numi Rapace, Charlie Plummer, Sophia Lillis, uh, which is sort of like a twisted western, which is what we're doing. Hopefully, that'll be coming together really soon. I'm at Elliot Lester 88 on uh, Instagram. Cool. Um, that's me. Thoroughly appreciate your time. Thank you, Elliot. Good luck. Go write your, uh, your opus. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.